uh, field, the professional like field or the business field, field, field is, I think, one of the most amazing parts that drives me. Chief, my question to you, and I'll, I'll explain the why we call him Chief because he was uh, AMS president in uh, 2000 and won the president of the Millennium Award and I was part of PR committee then and ever since we have called him Chief and that still continues uh, the same. So I have never been able to call him by any other name. Uh, Chief, why did you think of Symphony as cooler manufacturing company? I mean, why not AC? Why not anything else? I mean, you come from a business background, the family they have has a very, very big name to record with family business, anything you could have done, why coolers? Why symphony? In fact, I was just telling Meetup a little while ago. I spent five years here, I am an architect by training, so this is my background, you know. And after architecture, one thing, you know, I also get the family business, real estate. But it happened build a house where the parts of the house which couldn't be air conditioned and, uh, and our consultant suggested air cooling and uh, till then this is about 30 years ago and till then you know, we never used an air cooler, air coolers were not really known in Gujarat uh, but when we used this product it was really incredible, the performance it gave was incredible but since there was nothing good available you know the idea occurred then why can't you make something better so I think, you know, way, it sort of ties in with your previous question about him, about what is entrepreneurship all about. I think entrepreneurship is the is the, the passion to solve problems, uh, is to, to look at opportunities and to, uh, to have the drive to convert the opportunities into a reality. I think uh, sort of that's what I would say the story is. My question to Nita Venice. I mean, you come and before we, I go to my question and it's in two parts. One, you need to explain to audience your relationship with uh, Shri Magan Bhai and uh, then also that coming from that dynasty, that family, how did you take industrial uh, pursuit and then where did that come from? So can you explain your connect first and then? Uh, well, I'm the great grandniece of Gandhi Ji and Mangala Gandhi was his nephew, my grandfather. I mean, you all live in Ahmedabad and if you go to the Riday Kuti at the Sabarmati Ashram, just next to it, a little at the corner is Magan Niwaz. That's where my grandfather lived. And Gujarati Maa Kya Lakshu Chai Ke Mara Haat Khan, Mara Haat Pag Aat Khan, Magilal Hata Tara Te Chehu Prakasho. So that was a relationship between my grandfather and Gandhi. And it's also written in his autobiography. Now, he went to Africa, South Africa, to be a merchant. And Bapu said that you please join in in my Mari Ladat Matu Chodaicha. So he left his business and he joined Bapu over there. And since then he was with Gandhiji. My father was born there. And they came to Ashram. They lived in Ashram for so many years. My father enjoyed the Ashram life, you know. He started in Shanti Niketan. He was. Uh, 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 he became a technocrat in sense whenever there was a problem at the ashram, whether it, it, it related to any mechanical, electrical stuff, and my father would go and resolve it. So one fine day, he went and told Babu, I don't want to be here. I want to go and start my own business. And Babu said, okay, what will you do? So then he worked with the GD Billa for two years, and then he went to Bombay and started his own factory. So that's how the ashram life turned into my father became a businessman and he started the first electric motor uh, company in uh, Bombay that was Bharat Bijuri, I'm sure you would know about it. Uh, and uh, But being a Gandhian, being so principled, you know, it was very difficult for him to, uh, you know, the business is very different, you know. Uh, so he had a class stand foundry and I used to work with him as, even while I was in school, I used to go and I never wanted to be with my mother in the kitchen or at home. And so that's how I always wanted to be a businesswoman and that's how I got into business. Uh, uh, so that's my story of being into business. I uh, wanted to ask you, is that uh, we all know you come from one of the first and the most leading families of real estate of uh, Ahmedabad, and I'm uh, and my father and your uncle and you are looking for anyone into construction field. He's like an icon and a legend. So, and you yourself, you just said you are an architect too. So, 
from being that and a part of that family and suddenly coming out of nowhere with an air cooler business, how did that struck you and how did that transition happen? I just explained, you know, how I got into it, but um, it was a you know big challenge because uh, you know. The, the, the background wasn't of manufacturing or the background wasn't of uh, anything to do with what I eventually ended up doing. But, uh, but then you sort of learn along the way and uh, I think as Gita Bell has also mentioned uh, a little while ago, in the kind of challenges one faces, uh, I think life is a wonderful teacher and I think you sort of learn along the way. And uh, when you do something for so long, you know, you sort of tend to understand what to do or more importantly, you understand what not to do. And, um, and um, you know, my life has also seen its uh, sort of uh, a share of challenges, uh, ups and downs, uh, and and the, the bad times, the rough times are when you learn the most. And uh, um, like I said, most important thing is to, to learn, you know, what not to do. And, you know, you sort of stay conscious about that. I think, uh, uh, you know, uh, you can't go to the wrong in life. Thank you. Gitanti to you, um, you started in a time where women entrepreneurship was some word which probably didn't even exist at that time and then being a part of your family I've heard and I've seen you know the transitions happening. Today when Jewel Brushes are, is at this level as one of the most respected companies of crude brushes in India, manufacturing crude brushes, but I have two questions. One is how do you foresee the transition in women entrepreneurship from there to women leading industries now? And second is, why is still that we don't have women into businesses like, you know, probably cement or cement or bricks? You know, there are so many categories of business that women do, still don't get. Uh, well, well said. Uh, when I started six, uh, believe it or not, I started sitting in a garage. You know? Although my machine was in a air conditioned room because it was, it, that is how it was. You know, it had to be in an air conditioned room. And when we started in, I started, let's say, in 70s, um, I mean, 80s, rather, 86 when I started, I think those were the days uh, uh, of uh, license raj, inordinate delays. I remember going to the factory and people making snide remarks at me that who the hell is she, what is she plan trying to do? And I used to get very upset and angry, but that used to be a great driving force, you know, that what the hell do they mean, you know, I'm going to show it to the world, you know, that I can do business and we, you know, I can run a business. So I think those are very difficult days. I remember one incident that I can tell you. Uh, I needed a, that was, that was a very small loan that I can talk about it, which is not, which is so different now. But you wanted a loan of 12 lakhs of rupees to pay my, duty, you know, customs duty, and uh, I made 22 visits to GIIC in Ahmedabad. And today, if I have to get 20 crores or 50 crores, don't even visit the bank, you are sitting in the, in your office, people come and get your documents signed. So things are really different now, and I think uh, if anyone wants to start a business now, they are in a far better position. First of all, uh, the deal is, is something, you know, there's so much of, uh, you know, uh, there's so much of comfort level that you have uh, from the government, uh, from your, uh, you know, peer uh, group that it's not so difficult anymore. Uh, uh, not only that, I remember, you know, starting a factory, you know, where you are hands-on, uh, trying to handle everything, your sales, purchase accounts, your technical problems, everything. I think uh, in India today still you don't find that. And I'm sorry to say that we have many women professionals, but hardcore business women in India is still not there. And I think we need to really, uh, you know, sort of, uh, uh, you know, engage ourselves and see how we can really encourage women who can go into hardcore businesses, like you said, bricks or making machines, or it's it's not so, uh, you know, very difficult even today. And uh, I feel that although there is a lot of, number of schemes which are there now, we don't find women uh, wanting to take risks. And that is also because of our socio-cultural hindrances that women have today. 
Do you agree that you still have the social culture? Yeah, I don't know. I'm probably lucky. I passed that stage. Uh, but I think uh, when I say socio-economic, uh, cultural or cultural difference, I mean hindrances are more related to, uh, you know, that a woman, a woman cannot be in a, uh, a be a, she can be an entrepreneur in doing so many things, she can do a jewelry business, she can do a, a garment business, when I'm talking about hardcore engineering business, yeah, there are women who have sat on the throne because, you know, she is the only heir or because there's nobody else or because she, uh, the father wanted it but you know to be starting from a scratch and uh, you know like for example we have machines which are uh, highly the state of the art machinery very very uh, precision machines and to be able to understand the mechanics of it is something it's still very very far away I think for our country. Uh, you know, I just want to retaliate on the fact that Gita Aunty, despite of everything, and years back when she started that journey, a licenses, a factory to set up, labor issues, who am the chilla, art for us, the other, who is the Arki, me, in the factory, ma be, e art for us, the man, the strikes, so he said, issues, do I say, labor issues, do I say, kit like import, export related issues, do I say, and she comes out as a winner every time. You know, she is an example for many women aspiring to even think about, you know, setting up an industry or business coming out of the luxury stores and, you know, the comfort zones. Chief, my question is for you. Uh, every entrepreneur has a threshold. Somewhere, sometime, we have to say that not only entrepreneur, every human being, it's just now, now it's not much more. And it is said that success only happens when you push pressure on one push or go to the last limit. You think that you have to go from here and go to the next one. Was there a threshold kind of feeling in once in any time in your life when you said, now I have to give up and then you decided against it and went to it? Actually, I didn't give up but I think people around me had thought that I was giving up. I was going to give up. You know, the situation was so bad. So, so the situation was so bad that people were in fact recommending that uh, you know that I should maybe join the family business or uh, even migrate to USA. All kinds of things people were even talking about. But I think uh, again an essential ingredient of being an entrepreneur is the perseverance and the drive and uh, uh, you know I would say the the complete uncompromising attitude that you have to you cannot fail. You may not succeed, but you cannot fail. You cannot just throw in the towel. I think that spirit is what basically drives entrepreneurship. Um, and uh, you know, it would have been very, very easy uh, at times to have. Uh, you know, there was a time when it would have been very easy for me to sort of throw in the towel and uh, and do something else. But then to fight against all odds and to sort of have the conviction that this is something which you have started and you want to see it through. Um, is is I think again an essential ingredient of entrepreneurship. Um, so uh, you know, I mean, everyone's been through rough times. You know, we're talking with, uh, about what uh, they have been through, and maybe you know, you and your family may have also been through bad times. But I think uh, uh, I think the the determination to see things through, I think, is really what sets us apart. Does it also work when nobody else is believing in you, and people are talking around? Mm -hmm quote-unquote, uh, in, in like, you know, you are a Twitter or something, what keeps you going then? Like, whatever it is, I, I'll take it up. What keeps you going? What is one mantra that you share with your audience? One mantra is, you have to have a thick skin. <laughs> <laughs> you cannot let people's uh, expectations or perceptions bother you or guide you. You know, you have to have your own convictions and be completely oblivious to the ambient noise around you. You have to remain focused and just forget what people are thinking, saying, whatever. You know. you just do what you need to do. So, we say that in the sea, the sea is going to be peace from the sea. So, that is the biggest thing that you have decided that you have to go. And you have to stay on the four sides. So, I think that's a big learning. I'm going to write that as a graphic on the wall that you may not succeed, but you cannot fail. For me, one of the biggest takeaway from your conversation has been that. Either way, my question for you also is the same. Must have been there is some time when you felt enough. You haven't given up, that's why you are here.
determination to be able to achieve and be an achiever i think nothing stops you and setbacks are something which are going to be there i think they themselves become a great driving force and they also teach you a lot of humility so setbacks are always welcome because what they can teach you that setbacks can teach you i think they they learn lessons learned forever and also uh you you will make sure that you won't make those mistakes again so we've been talking about learnings on some day you 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 both have learned a lot in the journey so what is that one thing that first we can start with achal bhai that you would want to redo you know in the entire journey you given a chance like something ke je tumar fari nahi karu chhe ke hum na karo ye bhi kai question chhe If I ask, but the first one, I have no regrets in life. <laughs> so I knew this is coming. No, <laughs> so whether you know the good things or the bad, I think it's all part of life. You know, it's sort of destined to happen, and one has to live for the life which is being sort of charted for you. Uh, so really, honestly, no regrets in life. I would, uh, I don't think I would change anything. But um, what I think, one thing that uh, uh, I would have maybe done differently was. I, you know, I, mean, I started off being very focused uh, in the initial years of the business, you know, with one product, one category, and then, you know, diversified into uh, various things, uh, various other categories, and the diversification was what caused uh, a lot of financial stress on the company. And Symphony became a, you know, a BIFR company, and uh, when, and then we refocused back onto uh, onto our original business. um and that's how we started doing well again so i think um focus and i think all of us have to discover what we do best uh and really just do that rather than try uh, you know a million things and the world there is so much opportunity in the world that it is very easy to be tempted by uh by 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 all kinds of opportunities you know where you may or may not have strength in so i think it is important for us all of us to recognize what is our strength and to remain focused on that despite you know all the other opportunities tempting opportunities that one might uh, come across so i think uh, essentially you know this is what uh, that's, that's a very big lesson i think uh, and big take away for all of us about focus because a lot of us try and do a lot of things and try and diversify as soon as the first step of success is achieved and that's where the you know you start uh, taking up the extra cash flow and a lot of other things that come along with the success gitanji yours um, i do agree i think i have no regrets but uh, uh, making two brushes is uh, which we started with which i started with yes i also dabbled into a few different things and failed so yes there has to be laser like focus and you have to be persistent and what is important that one stick you stick to your core competence i think that is something which uh, i would not make a mistake now that when you know you stick to your core competence like our core competence is okay making two brushes and variety of two brushes you know from low end to the most premium quality and uh, i think if i had to restart again i wouldn't make a mistake of that because that really uh, had a lot of financial burden on the company and probably had that not you know had i had not dabbled into that i think we would have been a bigger company now you know although we are one of the largest in the world but i think we one of the largest we third largest so we could have been better off so the important was to make entrepreneur ek successful industrial study hoye chhe ke apna 
employees ne apna taraf trust badi something that keeps them loyal and bonded to the organization which is the bigger and if you have that that's one of the success mantras so how to do that what is it that you are following a chalta in your company to you know make sure that the employees really swear by you Just, just to put that, I can vouch for it. But Sydney has very, very long duration uh, people who have been there with you for years. Yes, I agree. I mean, how do you do that? First of all, we don't even use the word employee in our company. Ah. You know, so we don't think of them as uh, we don't think of the company as an employer and the individual as an employee. I think um, uh, you know we all sort of work oh. together for a common cause. Um, and uh, I think you know when uh, when you sort of set the example of uh, of being very passionate about your business and uh, uh, you know very dedicated to what you are doing. You know you're not spending half a day playing golf or playing playing poker or or bridge in a club. They know that day in day out, 24 by 7, uh, you know you are thinking of the business, and I think that becomes something which. Uh, inspires uh, the rest of the team, um, and uh, you know if you also another thing is you know with focus comes uh, uh, comes uh, I would say excellence, and uh, and the quest for excellence is also what what inspires people. I think everyone, all of us from within internally, we want to do our best, but we want to be provided an environment where we can prove uh, to do our best. And so, if you provide that kind of environment where people are challenged, where people have the ability to really do their best in whatever they are doing, and you know, you don't compromise on excellence. You know, you demand the best work, and then people are able to rise up to that. And I think that is what inspires people. You know, that that they are being, uh, you know, that they have to do very well. That, that the best of is expected from them. I think that in itself is a great motivator. So this is the exactly the energy he brings into the <laughs> symphony family. Gitanti, how do you still keep the twin family flag shining high on this? I think uh, it's been uh, more than 25 years that I've been in this business, and we've also had people who've been working with us for 30 plus years. Uh, I think very important that I would like to put across is. Uh, setting an ethical tone in the organization. Uh, also, ensuring that you create excellence in what you do, and building a trusting environment in the organization. I think that is what has kept us going. And uh, yes, we've had bad times. We recently, just two years ago, we also had a strike, which was very shocking for us because. Uh, after you know, seeing that you know we all live as a family, work as a family, work as a team. I mean, how did that happen? But yes, sometimes you fail somewhere, and uh, that also teaches you a number of lessons. So I think uh, it's a, uh, as you said, you know, you're not playing golf or not playing poker, and uh, it's a, you know, it's a line of command which is a top-down line of command. As to how you set an ethical tone in the organization, and uh, I think that really sells everything. To me, I think that has made a lot of difference to all our stakeholders, whether they are suppliers, customers, uh, you know, people working with us. I think that is what has made the difference, and that is what has helped uh, grow the business. Thank you. Uh, any questions? That anyone wants to ask, Paris? Yes, sir. एक बार मेरे सामने मेरे प्रोग्राम में आपने जो इतना कुछ क्या आपने आप सोमे जे जे फिल्म में एचयू का मुझे कम लोग बोल रहे थे। I'm retired IAS officer. राज्य सरकार ने इतने साथे खावा पड़ा था परिस्थिति मैडम बहुत जुदी 
present in your generation in your generation you either you earn profit or you earn loss that define the success of a business now the entire it's not only a particular business the entire industry is defined as a bubble so when you say the startups which are valued at millions and billions they are a part of that bubble burst so do you really consider this as a business because when we term use the term gujarati ma apne kahiye dhando dhando karo etle paisa kamava etle profit karo do you really as you you, you forecasted it as an adventurous future for the youngsters but in your term because we we can project the future on basis of data analysis you have seen the entire thing for the last 30 years do you seriously consider it as a business actually you know i think one should maybe today's times redefine uh, what is business what business is about business may not be about forget profits i think business is probably about creating wealth or creating a world around you is able to give you value without profits then maybe i'm wrong you know um, in 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 my company unless we make a profit we will not have a valuation we are a listed company and we have a, a value based on our top line and, our, and on our bottom line and the cagr that we have to consistently show quarter in quarter out but uh, but in the new world uh, of startups and especially tech startups uh, it doesn't matter uh, you know whether you have a profit or not what matters is that you have customers you have eyeballs and the world is willing to pay a value for that so it's a completely different paradigm i'm not saying this is right or this is wrong but it's a completely different paradigm and who knows maybe this is the future one last question one last question and the mic is on the sapan there yeah just one last question uh, we have misunderstood the term startup as you mentioned as tech startups for us any startup has it in it is it logically valid because even a person who is starting his own shop is actually a startup sure sure absolutely i agree with you but i mean today startup is being defined as a as a tech startup but there is digitalization also and the entire technology shift that has come into place that's the reason we are facing this but the way the startup incubation centers and that idea of giving them platforms is coming up you know ramaji is also working with a lot of the incubation centers and you know they are trying to bring in that change wherein that innovation also see ultimately that innovation also will have tech into it but that innovation of things innovation of platforms innovation of products are also startups and that are being encouraged in the way of course the ecosystem still needs to build in but i think startup is the answer to the biggest challenge of 1 million youth pumped in every year, every month in the country Yes. So, yeah. Uh, with due respect, uh, you have been in the brick and mortar business, like you said, and have been successful over the past 30 years. Now, my question is: uh, over the period of time, and as we see today, for example, you may find challenges that you have to accept. Of course, you believe in yourself. You believe in your focus. You believe in taking your set of people with you in your thought process and what you do best, like she just said. But along the way you may come across circumstances or technology that proves to threaten you for example there is now this pooling available in places like dubai where i come from and for a, an air cooler thing which may or may not work in an environment like that it's not very far away that india may also have a district cooling system so what in it's a district cooling system district yeah it's called a district cooling system we have different agencies like the power cooling we have the farm district cooling which actually do communities they are actually an air conditioning through a water pipe system a cold water pipe system more like the heat exchanger and cooling towers philosophy in the engineer so i come from an engineering background and i am an entrepreneur myself and i realize that technology tends to hinder your growth process or at least change your focus for example i may be good for the last 30 years in producing an air cooler but today it may not be relevant to the society we live in or maybe no, the, the government then no, that uh, you know segment may choose to upgrade their systems does that mean feel threat exactly. something like that but it's actually exactly your question so his question is whether we are the threat of disruption yes am i right yes by the environment not yeah, by people people, people of course will be oblivious like you said of what people say but by the environment we live in by technology overtaking or maybe changing your sure. so technological disruption um fortunately 
you know, I don't see that happening in my lifetime. Um, you know, and uh, the air cooler market is still huge, um, and we have. Although we have the largest market share in the unorganized sector or in the organized sector, but there is this huge unorganized sector in the country. Besides, we export to some 60, 70 countries, and we export to even the Western world. We export. We have we have a manufacturing facility in Mexico. We have manufacturing in China. We sell. We have offices in USA, in Russia. You know, in the Western world as well. And in all those countries, also, you know, we have we don't see this product being. Uh, disrupted or so being obsolete. This is an example. This is an example. I'm not targeting at your product. Uh -huh. But no, generally, I was thinking, yeah. uh, but it probably make it offline. There's some that is and that should be So, so basically, as far as you know, uh, I, I, I mean, maybe I understood the question differently. As far as I am concerned, or our industry is concerned, we don't really foresee disruption. I can't really uh, comment on anything other than that. I have a question for Keita, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, uh, like sir just now mentioned that you know today the uh, valuation is of idea, and you started, Mr. Achal, you started with air cooling because you saw in your home that you know it was something that will, and you started with toothbrush. Means you, ma'am, this is very basic thing. Like air cooling, it is a basic human need. Toothbrush is a basic human need. You know, I know other, uh, other uh, means uh, entrepreneur who started off with toothbrush was Ronnie Screwer. Like you know. And he made it otherwise. So I just wanted to know that what was the idea behind, you know, getting into toothbrush means you could have manufactured anything. There are <laughs> thousands of thousands of articles that are manufactured. Like sir could have manufactured AC and still made money, right? So uh, and when circumstances are changing today, climate change and you know coolers are selling more because people are and CM is with uh, toothbrush means people. Th this is very basic. So how you got this idea? And uh, and you export to so many countries. So how do they uh, take it? Means your product is taken there. To brush that, sir, we Gujarati ma daatar kare, but it's one of the most difficult product to make. Uh, unless you see the factory and if you see the machine being used and the way it is made, uh, you will really not uh, understand. You know how difficult it is to make a toothbrush. Now, uh, having said that. You're very right, you know, how did I get into this? So it was very um, interesting. The toothbrush is made in India, which was, I'm talking about in 80s, late 80s, and they were literally called chadu, you know? And it was at that point of time that one of the multinationals managing director happened to tell one of my family members that, look, do you have a way of making better toothbrushes in India? And they all said, no, that we don't want, we're not interested in this business. I happened to be there and I said, yeah, toothbrush, I, I, will, I, will, I would love to uh, dwell into this uh, idea and uh, start making toothbrushes. That is how we started. But we did not want to make the uh, run of the mill toothbrushes. So we imported a machine from Germany uh, and we changed the entire scenario in the entire country because we were, people thought we were fools because when the machine was available in India for, Hundred thousand rupees. Uh, we spent exactly, uh, you know, at that point of time, fourteen hundred thousand rupees, and so that changed the, you know, it was a quality, consistent quality, uh, large volumes, high productivity, better looking brush, and uh, today, yes, we also supply to over uh, fifty four countries in the world, and. Uh, there are so much, so many, we have 300 SKUs, by the way. So you can imagine, you know, that even Dattan Jevi Chijma apparently where I do a I think this is how I got into toothbrushes. But any business for that matter, you know, it doesn't matter which product it is. What is important is creating excellence in that particular product. And ensuring, you know, that you also earn out of it. Not just the valuation, as you know, you would <laughs> say in startups. Just take that last question, sir. Yeah. Hello. Uh, I had the pleasure of working with Anil Bhai for a couple of years, and uh, I met Achal Bhai once, twice when he was at the Bakeri House. Uh, but it's a very generic question to all of you. Uh, I mean, you have started and you had your own ups and downs, but today, where you are, do you see, foresee? 
kind of your projections, your sales over the five year, ten year, or it has become too dynamic. We you know, probably look at that kind of a longer horizon. How, how do you kind of uh, foresee the next five years, ten years? Generally. Uh, that has to be there. You know, there has to be a forecast. There has to be planning. And uh, one more uh, answer to, you know, how do you keep going in the same business? You continuously innovate. Because if you don't innovate, if you're not with the technology changes in the world, you would definitely get marginalized. So whether it's a startup business or I'm sure uh, Achal Bhai's business or my business or anyone else's business, unless you continuously uh, innovate and continuously be with the world, you know, what is it that they want, what is the gap there, you know, what is it uh, uh, the consumer want, I don't think you can really keep going. But planning is something, yes, we look at planning for next five years and ten years as to where we want to be. I mean, I think that sure Achal Bhai also does that. Certainly. But are you an investor? Sorry? Are you an investor? Are you, uh, uh, have, do you have symphony shares? Is, is that where your question is coming from? No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> I was told to buy it, I didn't yes. buy it. You should have actually. Yes. Now I have been thankful that you want to. Have you? Okay. <laughs> so, thank you, thank you so much indeed to uh, both our guests and a big hand to them. Thank you so much. I think one of the most amazing sessions that I have had as a speaker, moderator and a panelist and really entrepreneurship as Achal Bhai said today, of course, really still remains one of the biggest attempts and you know the risks that a human takes for turning his dreams into reality and when you do that, you can proudly call yourself entrepreneur. But what goes behind that you know, that journey of being a startup to a successful entrepreneur and the steps in between and the focus and the passion and the determination which it drives along with you, your company, your staff, your family. That's what, you know, is both the people sitting here are truly wonderful examples of and really thank you to them. Thank you to GLF and the entire team for allowing us and making us a part of this amazing session and giving us a chance to meet you all. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much everyone. Thank you. 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 Thank you.